Well, hey, I want to welcome all of you to this podcast of Behind the Scenes as we are looking at the Gospel of Mark. And we're so glad that you've joined us. If this is something that uh, you are that is helping you, we hope that uh, you will share it uh, with others. We hope that you will like it and uh, give us your feedback. We're always interested in that as well. And so uh, grab your Bibles. We're looking at the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. Uh, this is a journey that we're going to be on for quite some time. We, we just started the, the Gospel of Mark, and I've called it Focus. That's the, the title of, uh, of this series. I, I actually have changed it from the, using the word series to using the word journey, uh, because we're going to be in it for a long time. I, I really think we're probably looking that we'll be looking at the Book of Mark maybe even into the summer. And so uh, we hope you'll take the journey with us as we discover who Jesus is. Mark causes us to focus in and uh, and look at declaring him as the son of God. Uh, He'll start with that. He'll end with that. And if you'll know uh, about Mark, he doesn't give a birth account. Um, He doesn't tell us about Mary and Joseph. He doesn't go into Mm -hmm. any of those details. And then he doesn't give us much information following the resurrection. He just says Jesus has risen, and he helps us to live in that tension of, and, and looking at who Jesus is. So we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Levi if he would pray for us, and then Pastor Connie if she would read the text. Let's look at it together. Go ahead, Levi. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that we can gather here. And we can explore your word and together as a not only as a staff but as an entire kind of people god as we as we communicate our different perspectives our different thoughts ideas and what we see um, i pray that you would speak into the lives of all those that are joining us um, whether online or in in the podcast form or in the video cast form god i pray that you just give us open ears open eyes open hearts to receive what you have for us today as we prepare um, for this journey. God, I pray all these things in your blessed name. Amen. 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 So Connie, go ahead. All right. Mark chapter one, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the son of God. It is written in Isaiah, the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Mm. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. One through eight. And the word of the Lord. got to say after, after a, Hearing that again for a second time, there's a part of me that wanted to jump up on uh, my table. There's good news <laughs> from the sermon this last last Sunday. <laughs> well, and, and I want to say to our listening audience that uh, if you didn't get the chance to listen to our video cast last week, we spent our time just in the first 14 words of, uh, of Mark, the first verse. Um, as I mentioned last week, Mark is the shortest of all the Gospels, and yet he he is packed. His words are packed with meaning. And so last week, we we took a look at these words like beginning and gospel and Jesus and the Messiah and um, the Son of God. And we talked about what that meant for us. So we're really diving in, in many ways, in verses 2 through 8. But that, uh, that opening verse is significant. So... So, gang, what do you see as we take a look at this text? Well, John's kind of an interesting guy. I mean, he kind of, I don't know, I get the picture just like, here comes wild man. (laughs) You know? 
Yeah. Out. Yeah. What's out the, the, the what's the visual yeah. that comes into your head when you uh, if we live into the story, think about being at the edge of the Jordan River and uh, this guy is preaching. Tell me what you see. Oh, man. Well, he's kind of, at least I see, you know, I picture him kind of as the hippie-esque, madman-esque, you know, the guy with the long beard, scruffy beard, messed up hair, and he's out there and he's, you know, preaching in, in the in the wilderness and just based on the description and stuff, I, I picture him as kind of, yeah, this, this untamed sort of, sort of guy who is just out there and kind of surviving off of, you know, it's like, it's a fine line between like someone who's homeless and someone who's like just a really kind of not crazy, but he's kind the of crazy, vagabond. You know? Yeah, exactly. The, the hermit or whatever or something, the guy who thinks that like everyone in the city has lost their minds and, uh, is corrupted by the whatever but all that aside i mean it's that's just what my the image that comes to my mind is um well let's talk but, about yeah. what we think comes to their mind um you know last week levi you mentioned that that there's some powerful imagery that is in these texts and that idea of a uh, leather belt around his waist camel's hair uh that that's an image for the people uh that is that takes you can find that reference back in the story of elijah if you go back into kings yeah yeah i think that's what pops out in my mind is kind of that elijah maybe a little bit elisha too because how they carry their ministry so closely but but just that strong prophet and even into the details of how he dresses and living in the desert or coming from the desert, you know, as Mark says, um, I mean, preaching in the dead, baptizing in the desert re region, but yeah, just kind of that, that Elijah imagery that seems to tie in so strongly. And what do we know about the character of Elijah? That guy had some tough messages. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as a prophet. And, but really actually, a lot too i mean we see of all the prophets in a narrative form we see him a lot in narrative form we have so many of the other prophecy books but elijah we have more of his of narrative forms of what he was doing with the king and, and in israel and trying to call god's people to be god's people and but he, he had a rough go too <laughs> well elijah is the one Elijah is Mount Carmel. He's the experience between the prophets of Baal and uh, the living God. Mm -hmm. so maybe your God is in the bathroom guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically saying, Elijah declares very clearly there can't be two gods. Yes. Can't be. Um, both, cannot be both cannot be true. And so he makes those declarations. So yeah, he's a powerful preacher. He comes with strong words. He's, he doesn't hesitate to tell, tell the story, tell the truth of where the gospel is at, where the good news is at. And, and John is that way as well. Because if you read John in other gospel accounts, you know, John's the one that uh, uh, declares to Herod, you better stop living with your brother's wife. You better get things yeah. together. Yeah, because you both John and and Elisha, I mean, so much of Elisha's calling things out was because of a call back to God's people, right? Even the Mount Carmel story is, no, you need to know who God is because this is who you need to follow. You are God's people. You need to follow God. Um, and here's John then calling for repentance. You are God's people. You need to follow God. Your, your heart needs to be there, not just your claim in lineage, but your heart needs to be there. I don't know if that's called the answer to this question, and yet I think it's, why are the people attracted to him? I mean, they're coming out in droves. One, one writer said that John could have baptized, check this out, some 300,000 people. So all these That's people are coming from the countryside and they're coming out into the wilderness. 
He's inviting them out to the wilderness and they're responsive to that. I, I wonder what the attraction is. I think one of the things that uh, we mentioned earlier as we were kind of talking about this is, is the timing of it all too. That this, this timing is after a very long period where God has been silent and the people have mm -hmm. not heard anything. I see this as like a revival sort of thing. I mean, I picture our, our, our old tradition of the Nazarene church, the, the tent meetings and the camp meetings and all these people like going out and, and uh, spending weekends over and just listening to the word of God and stuff. I mean, that's part of our heritage as a Nazarene church, but I think that's exactly what this is, is that for the first time in what seems like so long, God is, is moving again, or God is speaking again. We are getting uh, kind of the first words for who knows how long where we see that God, God is doing something like something's happening and it's with this guy out in the wilderness and, and he's preaching and he's baptizing people. And there's this radical message um, for these, the people of Israel to get baptized and kind of repent from their sins and stuff, because something's coming, something's happening. And that's what John is saying that I love, I love John's character. John is such a, a cool character that is so humble and su such sees his work knowing exactly what he's doing um and what his purpose is that one of he has one of my favorite statements um he makes later on i don't know if it's in mark but one of the later statements he makes is you get the story of uh john's disciples coming to john and saying there's this guy his name's jesus and he's going around he's stealing your followers man he's baptizing people more more people than you I mean, you see all your thunder. You had these great crowds and stuff and all these people around me. <laughs> and he says, no, no, no. He's like, you must become greater and I must become less. And that is a wonderful statement. And I think there's another section where he turns his disciples to go follow Jesus and spend the, spend the evening with him rather than yeah. himself. Just so, oh, such a cool character. <laughs> and John always knew who he was and he always knew who he wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. They ask him, are you the Messiah? Nope. I'm not. That's not who I am. I think that's important. Um, and he says, this is like a foretaste sort of thing. He says, you know, I'm baptizing you with the water. Like, and this is just a taste. This is a small little kind of tidbit of what is to come. There's going to be someone who comes later who baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. Like, I think is that one of the first times we get that that kind of word like because we we don't necessarily know right the the whole concept of the trinity doesn't really come in in this time right it, well we get um if you're if you're looking back into the old testament you definitely have imagery of god the father and of the holy spirit holy spirit is mentioned even back in genesis 1 verse 2 and the spirit hovered over the waters uh, okay. yeah. but not, we don't see him in his fullness. We don't get the glimpses. We, we know that people like David and Elijah mm -hmm. and Elijah, mm -hmm. uh, they had the anointing of God. They had the, they had the, the Holy spirit, but, but not in his fullness, not as he will come after the experience in Acts chapter two. So, yeah, I had a professor. I want to say it might've even been in, in my graduate stuff that really was trying to help us draw out um, the distinction maybe somewhat between Old and New Testament with the Holy Spirit and that Old Testament, we tend to see that the Holy Spirit kind of comes on someone, mm -hmm. but then you get into New Testament and you move into, um, and Jesus tells him, you know, it will, the Holy Spirit will dwell in you. And then right. the, and then the New Testament and Acts chapter two, where the Holy Spirit, and then it, comes in them right and now we start talking about the indwelling of the spirit because uh, i think i could uh i could go off a little bit i might be wrong here but i think that even part of king saul even part of the description for him is that like god removed his spirit right because his heart turns so so there's right. more the idea of like an on uh, upon and then maybe off versus new testament where john begins preparing the way that no the holy spirit comes and baptizes in this total soaking and indwelling and then that's 
yeah, Jesus goes on to talk about it in John, how the Holy Spirit I be with you and then breathing the Holy Spirit into them. And, and so it's, awesome. it's kind of a beautiful setup. Yeah, there is. And I think it's really important for those of you who are journeying with us as best you can live in the moment. It's really easy to jump to Mark 16 or to, to think in light of the full revelation of what we know about who Jesus is. Mark is wanting to reveal him to us. So, yeah. so this idea of the repentance, this is not repentance as we would see it as New Testament Christians, because Christ hasn't died yet in the story. Um, it, it is a, a checking of your heart as, as, as if David would say in Psalms 139, search my heart, O God, and see if there's any wicked way in me. Um, it, it is aligning our hearts with God, knowing that something greater is about to happen. So, so I'll tie a thought back to one of your questions a minute ago, Pastor Tim, where you know, said, so what's drawing people out here? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something within that moment that uh, it's got to be that there are people who are genuinely repenting too. They hear his message and they genuinely repent mm -hmm. and they have this moment of baptism. They listen to John, but then they go back and it's got to be that the genuineness of repentance is evident enough that now, well, I want to go see what this guy is talking about. Yeah. And so I think that's some of the picture of genuine repentance when we really are humble with God to say, I, I have to be baptized. I, I do need to repent. There is something that God wants. So not me. I wash this away in order to be clean for before my God. You know, this genuine, re, genuine repentance, I think, is very attractive to those who are around us because it means we stop being us and maybe we start listening to how God wants us to be. Well, you might remember in the Old Testament that there are times like with Moses, he said, okay, the Lord's going to hover over this mountain. Now, go prepare your hearts. Get ready. Or in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 8, if somebody wants to read that at some point, if you want to, you who are, are, are uh, watching this with us, Nehemiah 8, you have the wall has been rebuilt. And so mm -hmm. Nehemiah brings in Ezra the prophet and Ezra begins to read the word. What's fascinating, though, in that story is that as the word is being read, there's discipleship taking place. There are people who are translating the word and interpreting the word. But mm -hmm. in the midst of the reading of the word, the Holy Spirit comes in and people are broken and they are weeping. And matter of fact, Ezra and Nehemiah kind of have to stop and say, whoa, 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 we're supposed to be celebrating today. They're so, <laughs> they're so convicted of their sin. And I think there's some of that that you're seeing here with John the Baptist because he's, he's proclaiming truth and so there is this conviction. And, and I have to think that we don't know all that's going on. I think the people are saying we don't understand everything, but we know there's something wrong. There's something between us and God. And we want to prepare our hearts and we're repenting. And, and there is this movement that's beginning. So, yeah, what a great, great picture. Do you, do you pick up anything of the imagery of the wilderness and the Jordan River? What would Jewish people have known about the wilderness and the Jordan mm -hmm. River? Well, I had to do something with the Jordan River, right? I had to walk. Maybe a few walk. times. Yeah. <laughs> a few times. But yeah, the wilderness um, in the Old Testament is a very is a place of of trial and temptation. We see that the you know that the uh, Israelites they go out into the wilderness for forty years to try to get Egypt out of them. Not so much that they needed God in them, but they needed to get Egypt out. Is one of uh, the common phrases that I hear a lot, but every time someone goes into the wilderness, it's this, it's this interesting place where there is trial and temptation, and there is kind of a refining period that, that you know, talking about the whole, uh, what, diamonds or gold, that they go through that mm -hmm. refining process or trial by fire sort of thing. That's what the image, I think, of the, the wilderness really is for the, these ancient Israelites, and to come out into the wilderness this kind of return to to get kind of broken to get messed up to get to literally like scramble your life and de mess up your normal routines and walks and where you can't get water just from you know the faucet or whatever the tap or the well you have to 
sometimes have Moses strike a rock or something <laughs> to get it out <laughs> to completely rely and trust in God's provision. Um, but yeah, the wilderness is an amazing uh, place of, of life-changing moments, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, this is, this is uh, you know, think about what happened in the wilderness. In the wilderness, you had to depend on God. Mm-hmm. Manna, quail, the presence of God, fire by night, clouds by day. Um, and it is, it is life-changing. So go back into the, go ahead, Connie, you had something. It looked like you wanted yeah, to say. Well, yeah, I was just thinking my comment, I guess, wilderness, um, I think in most of the narratives too, it's almost always the setup period before something amazing happens, right? So it's a setup period before they enter the promised land. Um, and I know this is living a little further ahead, but it's even some of the other things hinted that John is in the wilderness until he comes out pre- preaching, you know, and then Jesus will go to the wilderness before he goes out preaching. Yeah, you know, there, there's some, there's some setup too that wilderness implies i think throughout the narratives so one of the phrases that came to me in preparation is is that i'm not sure i can get to the water unless i'm willing to go through the wilderness Hmm. so yeah yeah just kind of meaning then that you there has to be some brokenness before repentance yeah yeah, I'm not sure I can get to the water until I've gone to the wilderness. Because most people that I experience, when they've come to Christ, there is there is a wilderness experience in their life. They, they're mm-hmm. broken. And they know that, you know what, I've been trying to do it on my own, and I can't do it here. And I need Jesus in my life. Think for a moment. Let, let's go through the imagery. One more picture. Let's let's talk about the Jordan River. Okay. What, that, what does that mean? Yeah, I, I know there's lots, but an obscure one that keeps coming to my mind as I started reflecting, knowing that this is one of our upcoming passages, is actually the story of Nahum when he mm-hmm. goes to Elisha, and and he has leprosy, and and he's not he's not an Israelite. Right. He's from a foreign army and he goes because he hears from a slave girl who is an Israelite about this man of God who can probably help his issue of leprosy. So he travels to him and Elijah, Elisha, excuse me, tells him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times and he scoffs at it. Like, are you kidding me? Are there not better rivers back home? This thing is disgusting. I'm not getting in there. And then the guys who are with him have to persuade him. Hey, look, you came all this way. Seriously, what's it going to hurt? Just get in the river and right. and God heals him. And he comes out of the river completely healed. But it's at the Jordan River where this happens. And it, so might not quite be the most obvious Jordan River account, but that's one that I always kind of pops in my mind and really popped up this time again, too. Mm. Well, the Jordan River, I just saw it in one of my little footnotes here is it's this kind of evokes this sense of restoration, this upcoming restoration mm-hmm. as it, you know, is the, literally the bridge kind of to the promised land for um, God's people in the Old Testament. And so uh, the writer here, the author who of the little footnotes mentions that it's probably um, signaled the, it signaled the entering of the promised land. And so it might evoke this these senses of this promise of restoration, um, mm. which I think is what's going to be coming in the next upcoming chapters. <laughs> that, well, that's a tie, though, to name him, too, right? Here he is restored, completely yeah. restored at the Jordan. Yeah. yeah. Places have a big impact. And, you know, I think it's sometimes undermined in our minds today because it's just it's a setting and stuff. But no, literally, like every kind of place usually has a significance to it. And when you look back, um, like, for example, take Egypt or whatever. Egypt is usually not, if you look through the Old Testament, whenever someone goes to Egypt, it doesn't end well. And, but then (laughs) you get this kind of flip script um, where Jesus then flees to, or Jesus and his family, Joseph and Mary, like we talked about in Advent, flee to Egypt. 
and then all of a sudden there's this kind of uh, turning of the mm. of the norm because you have this setup where it says like so and so goes to Egypt and bang, bad thing happens. Uh, someone else goes to Egypt, bang, bad things happen. Someone else goes to Egypt, bang, bad things happen. Jesus goes to Egypt and uh, kind of has a different story, put points it in a different direction. And so you know, but but these places have these different connotations. They have these images. They have these understandings that when someone says you know Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> like <laughs> it's, I mean, same as today or whatever, and wherever we're at, we have, you know, the connotations of a certain place evokes certain feelings, emotions, um, for whatever reason, you know, we, we think of like, if someone had came from the South, we might have some different images in mind. We might have some, some accents mm -hmm. that come to our, <laughs> come to our mind of how they might talk or something, but but all of that is still present in, you know, uh, scripture here as well. So looking at these key words and, and especially the idea of wilderness and, and such, what would, what would this have meant to a group of Gentile persecuted Christians in Rome? Because that's who Mark is writing to. I have found it fascinating that that Mark writes to Gentile Christians in Rome and starts his book with a Jewish story, a, a Jewish prophecy. You know, the, the, the opening of Isaiah comes from Isaiah 40. And Isaiah 40, we think, begins a new, a new chapter in the divisions of, of the book of Isaiah. And now there is this hope that they're going to be set free. And so, you know, Isaiah says there's this one who's coming. And... Uh, prepare the way of the Lord. And one of the things about preparation was that before a king would come, a team of people would be sent to where the king was coming and would prepare the land, get every and get uh, rough places are made level. Um, and so John was that leveler. Let's get things ready because the king, the king is coming. But what do you think the idea that this text means to a group of people who could, could very well be suffering for their faith, and some have family members who've died for their faith. Hmm. Well, I mean, I if think it's, it's, no, go ahead. <laughs> you're on it. <laughs> I think it's, you know, the, the sign of good news sort of thing that, I mean, maybe, I don't know if I'm entirely reading it in the correct light so correct me if i'm wrong but you know it starts out with the good news of about jesus the messiah that and the story of you know that implies this different restoration and this at this coming time that it's it's get ready i think that that something's coming something's going to change and i think it's like i said kind of a message of hope or whatever that that get ready like because something there's something different that's coming. That's that's going to completely change everything. Yeah, and I think your I think your question has to be a little bit in light of too. Okay, if, if we want to think about how those original hearers or readers received this, we kind of have to remember that they usually they would receive it in a whole. Like mm -hmm. we we take it in small chunks. Right, right. But they will. They would have received it in a whole, and so, so to open with an imagery of uh, the the king, the restorer, the one from the wilderness bringing promise and restoration, that this one is coming. I think that original hearer would hear the whole story to the end to resurrection, like this is the whole good news. Um, that the king has actually come. Mm. And in coming, brought repentance, brings baptism of the Holy Spirit, brings resurrection, brings the brings the King, brings the kingdom of God. And so I think it's a little bit hard to answer that when we look at a small chunk, <laughs> uh, because otherwise it is very Jewish. <laughs> and as a Gentile who may or may not understand all of judaism i don't know what that section means but in the whole is this that no there is 
the king has come. Right. And the whole big picture is the kingdom of God is not limited. You know, maybe, maybe that's some of why the story of Nahum can't, I can't get rid of it right now. It's because he's not a Jew. And yet at the Jordan River, he's restored. And so God's healing and God's restoration is not limited. It's through a people, but it's not limited to a people. So that's that's good news because if it's limited, I'm cut out. <laughs> Absolutely. And I just, I guess I think of the, uh, you're exactly right, Connie, by the way. And that's how we need to look at scripture. And remembering that chapters and verses didn't exist for a thousand years. And this yeah. would have been read to the church as a whole. And, and as we lead into, you know, again, peeking ahead a little bit, we have this Jesus who also went into the wilderness. And so if I'm living in the wilderness, I can know that he understands my wilderness. He knows where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the good news that the incarnation, um, Christ gets in the water with us and, uh, and meets us in our mess. And, uh, and though I may be persecuted for my faith, though I may go through struggles, whatever the case may be, um, I have a hope and my hope is in him because mm -hmm. in the end, he defeats death and we, uh, we rejoice in that. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope we've given you all some things to think about. Isn't it fun to journey through an entire book together? And uh, uh, again, as we're stopping at certain points, but we'll hope to see the whole in the midst of it. And we'd love to get your comments. And so uh, if you like this, share it with others and give us some of your feedback. We hope you have a great week. We hope that you uh, know today just how much God loves you and that you will share his love with those around you. God bless you. Thanks for joining us.